I'm Jonathan Tomkin from the University of Illinois. We know that there's going to be another two to three billion people on the planet over the next 40 years. So we also know that we need to produce a lot more food. How are we going to do that? There isn't that much virgin land available. Estimates vary, but around 10% of Earth's land masses could be converted from virgin land into farmland, potentially a little bit more than that if food prices climb. But nevertheless, that's not a satisfactory solution. Firstly, it might not be enough. And secondly, of course, this would mean that there'd be damage to ecosystems and the natural world, which we'd like to avoid. What's more, there are other limitations to agricultural expansion. Lots of water is required to grow lots of food. In 2012, the US had a terrible drought, the worst in over 50 years, and this had a big impact on the amount of corn produced. Food prices went up. Corn is a very central part of the US diet, and it's found in all sorts of foods. In fact, if you're in North America, pretty much any processed food contains corn or soy products. Foods that you might not think of, like ketchup, soda, uh, cookies, chips, all sorts of foods have corn in them. The US Department of Agriculture estimates that Americans pay 4% more for 2012 groceries than they did in the year before because of this uh, depression in food production. 4% isn't that much if it's the worst drought in 50 years. And it's a bit surprising too because it, corn is, as I've said, in so many products. Consider beef. About 90% of the tissue that comprises US beef comes from corn. But only 1 20th of the cost of a steak is the corn that was used to fatten the animal. Consumers in rich countries don't really feel the effects of changes in food prices. That's because the food that we tend to buy has many other expenses that make up most of the expense. So things like stocking, packaging, transport, uh, processing. These costs are really what we're paying for when we buy food. Consider a bowl of cornflakes. A bowl of cornflakes only has about a cent worth of, of corn in it at wholesale prices. But clearly it costs a lot more than that uh, at the point of purchase. And in fact, over the last century, if we adjust for inflation, food prices have dropped in real terms across the board. Largely this is because of advances in technology. As we can see in this painting of 15, from 1565 by Peter Bruegel, there has been enormous changes in the way agriculture is produced in much of the world. Here we see lots of workers and what is apparently a good crop, but it turns out of course here that the yield is much lower and the effort needed to extract that yield is much higher than it is in modern farming. Modern farming uses many new technologies uh, from 1565, of course, including things like tractors and equipment uh, like that. But also there's been enormous advances in plant breeding, fertilizers, um, and we now produce far more food for the same amount of land as we did in times past. Another way of saying that is, is we have much higher yields. And yields are very important because yields is the key to why we don't have a Malthusian condition today and the only way we can really avoid a Malthusian condition in the future. We have to increase yields. In the past century, increases in yields have been a much more important factor than increasing land under cultivation for increasing total crop production. Here we have a figure, dev means developing and ind means industrial. So you could think of this as developing countries versus industrial countries. Red is the increase in food production caused by increases in yields. And as you can see in industrial countries, this is the primary reason why yield, well, there's been a growth in yields. In developing countries, it's been a mixture. As more land has been bought under cultivation, that has also increased yields. As a consequence, world, total world grain production has been going up for decades. It's increased from around 1.25 tonnes per hectare to about 3.25 in the last 50 years. So that's almost three times as much. It's an incredible increase. So you can easily see if this sort of trend is sustainable, we can feed large number of people without damaging ecosystems and uh, turning virgin land into farmland. This is what avoided the Malthusian catastrophe in the 20th century, this vast increase in yield.
This hasn't just been going on in developed countries. In fact, some of the biggest increases have happened in developing countries. So for example, we can see here for countries of Mexico, India and Pakistan, since 1950 through to today, there's been enormous increases in the average yield per um, area of land. This, is in, this, this particular graph is in kilograms per hectare. So you can see that Mexico has higher yields than India and Pakistan do, and perhaps that's good news because it suggests that India and Pakistan still have room to increase their yields. And remember, the higher the yield, the more crop produced for the same amount of land. So we don't need an extra earth, we don't need to cut down rainforests if we can continue to increase yields. So what caused this big increase in yields? The so-called Green Revolution. And in some ways this prevented the population bomb from going off. That is, it prevented the increase in world population from resulting in mass starvation. What's amazing about this is it's largely attributed to one man, Norman Borlaug. He was a US agronomist and he won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work. And what he concentrated on was improving yields in developing country crops. It was very technology driven. The original Green Revolution used things like dwarf varieties. So for example, wheat that didn't grow as tall. So it put more energy into growing the bit that we eat and less into the stalk. Drought resistance. Um, hybrids with more disease resistant genes. And there were other big improvements as well. Some of which have not all been good, of course. Things like um, nitrogen ready crops that respond more to fertilizer. So as a consequence, the amount of fertilizer applied over the last 50 years has increased enormously. There's also other things like improving irrigation and the use of pesticides. In fact, we can't discount the use of these technical inputs, and this is another sustainability worry, because some of these um, inputs require fossil fuels. Increased use of fertilizer has explained between perhaps one third and one half of all the growth in yield since the Green Revolution. So, Factors like this are very important. So if we worry about sustainability in agriculture, we have to think about fertiliser. And the problem with fertiliser is, is that a lot of fertiliser is derived from fossil fuel inputs. There have been potential technical fixes to this in the future, but in the past this has not been necessarily a sustainable growth pattern. In fact, there's been a number of green revolution critiques. One, of course, is that it's promoted monocultures, and as we know, monocultures can be more fragile to disease or accident. Larger farms, because larger farms tend to be more efficient, and in this sense, of course, efficiency means higher yields, more crop per unit of area, um, but that changes local cultures. As I've mentioned, increased fertiliser use, and apart from the fact that this requires greater inputs, this can also damage local ecosystems. Here in the United States, I live in the Midwest, we use a lot of fertiliser locally um, for the corn and soy crops. Some of that fertiliser gets washed off and goes down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico where it creates algal blooms which kill fish. And this happens all around the world in fact as you can see from the reading. Also there's been increases in pesticide use which has impacted um, native species as well as pest species and increased water use and as we've seen there isn't a lot of room to increase water use in some places around the globe. So if we need to increase yields by increasing water use, we may have hit a wall. We appear to be dependent on Green Revolution techniques, however. If we were to return to pre-Green Revolution methods, we wouldn't be able to feed the world population of 7 billion, let alone the world population of 8, 9, maybe 10 billion, we'll see in the coming decades. So these are real trade-offs. There have been efforts by agronomists to try and ameliorate some of the disadvantages of the Green Revolution, which we'll talk about shortly, but nevertheless, uh, this remains a big challenge. There's another big problem as well. I mentioned that the world is water limited, and it's also limited in other ways in terms of increasing yields. As a consequence, the giant increase we've seen in yields over the last few decades has actually slowed down, and despite high levels of technology and lots of financial incentive, Japanese farmers, for example, have been un unable to increase rice yields over the last decade. In fact, we see the same pattern in places like South Korea, and China will shortly have the same yields as Japan. If we think of countries as big as China, Japan, South Korea, at the point where they cannot increase the yields, they've hit a technical limit, the new technology doesn't produce higher yields 
where there's no ability to increase the amount of food create, created per hectare, it might be that the growth that we saw in the 20th century cannot be replicated in the 21st century. This would suggest that food prices will increase as food becomes scarcer and we may head towards a more Malthusian scenario, at least in poorer countries. Another limit that I mentioned was water and it's being predicted that farmers will need to use 45% more water in 2030 than they do now, so that's in less than two decades, if yields are to continue to grow at the current rates. They're unlikely to get that much water. As we saw earlier this week, water is a limited resource and in many places in the world we're using it at that limit and sometimes beyond it. There, again, there might be technical fixes but these will cost money. Things like improved irrigation, drip irrigation for example, or in many places around the world, particularly in developing countries, there's a lot of water loss through evaporation. So it might be that by investing in infrastructure, which again will be expensive, we can provide more water and increase yields. But this again would point to food prices going up. All these factors mean that it's not just rice in East Asia which seems to have hit a plateau in production. If we look at cereal yields in many countries, we can see that the 21st century did not, does not look like the 20th century. There's a real plateau in yields if you look at countries like UK and France in Europe, or, or even developing countries like India and China, the rate of increase in yield has decreased or flattened. So this can be a real worry over the next 20 years. And the sorts of solutions that we saw work for the original Green Revolution might not be able to be pushed any further. We might have hit a natural limit. Of course, there are other technical fixes that we might use. I mentioned that fertiliser use is limited, especially since a lot of fertiliser comes from fossil fuels. But there are other fertilisers like phosphorus, which are a mined resource. So again, in principle, that's an unsustainable product. And even if it's true that we can increase production when prices go up, just as we saw for oil, if there's a higher price for a product, it makes it worthwhile to get uh, less concentrated um, sources or we can mine more marginal places. Nevertheless, this would also imply that food prices would go up because if the fertiliser inputs go up, then the, then the price of the, the produced product goes up as well. There might be some other fixes as well. It might be that on-farm efficiency, such as recycling biomass um, or other techniques, can also make fertiliser use more efficient. But again, if we use the fertiliser more efficiently, we have to pay for that efficiency, we have to pay for those extra processes, and again, that would push up the price of food. So it might be that we can still increase yields, but again, food prices go up. This seems to be a theme of lots of techniques we've talked about. We can increase yields, but it will cost money. Genetically modified organisms might be able to produce their own fertiliser, so that might be a way out of this conundrum. That presents its own difficulties. We'll talk about that in the next set of lectures. And before I leave you with these thoughts about the limitations of agricultural yield growth, there's another big thing coming around the corner, and that's climate change. Will climate change imperil food yields? We know that there will be changes in patterns of precipitation and increased temperatures in parts of the world. We, might, we don't know precisely though, so any estimate we make will be uncertain. This map shows a prediction of how climate will affect yields in 2080 relative to 2003. And this map assumes a business as usual scenario, that is, not much is done to decrease carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is what plants use to grow. This is what they use to build their structures. So for some plant species, an increase in carbon dioxide might actually increase their ability to grow, so it could increase yields. But of course, if we see changing patterns of precipitation or drought conditions, this would have negative impacts on yields. Interestingly, we see many countries around the world that have little or even positive impacts from climate change all the way through to 2080. These countries include Canada, the United States, Europe, Russia, China, Japan, very important countries. Looking at a map like this makes me wonder, where would there be a commitment for tackling climate change if the rich countries aren't really going to be that negatively affected, at least through most of the 21st century? So agricultural production in the 21st century looks like a challenging proposition. 
If we use the same techniques that made the original Green Revolution work, we might not be able to produce enough food to feed the coming billions. Or even if we are able to do that, costs will go up. And this will particularly impact people in poorer and developing countries where lots of this population growth is supposed to happen. There is one relatively new technique that has been growing quickly over the last couple of decades that's very controversial, but nevertheless may be very important in averting Malthusian conditions in some places around the world. That's using genetically modified organisms. We'll talk about this in the next lecture. Produced by OCE Atlas Digital Media at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign.